is the most famous story in the book of, uh, is it Kings? Yeah, um, where the prophet challenges the other prophets. Let us go to the mountain, bring your gods, isn't it? Let me bring my gods and let's have a conversation to see which god is superior. I think that's the kind of conversation I like. And I, it for me it demonstrates that God is interested um, in conversations, including of his own power or of his own religion or spirituality. But then as I thought about that also, I thought about Daniel. You remember Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego? And something happens there as well. I, I've thought about this for some time as I thought about religion and steps. And what happens there is that religious laws are made against Jewish religion. And it becomes illegal Check. Check. to worship Mike Yahweh, Check. for example. And these three gentlemen find that they are in trouble and they have got to be convicted for a crime of just being themselves, worshiping their own God. They end up in fire. And you, you know about the story, the fourth person appears and they're safe. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the radical effects of a religious state. And I'm just leaving it there until I start my conversation. I also thought and reflected about Jesus and his story with Caesar. I think you all know the story, most famous story in the New Testament. Um, Jesus is asked um, about whether we should pay tax. I think that was a very, very serious, strict question. And you know what he says? He says, give unto Caesar what belongs unto Caesar and unto God what belongs unto God. And I begin to get the idea that Jesus appears to be making uh, divide, you know, or, you know, right. describing two spaces, one space being the spiritual realm, the other one right. being sure. the government realm, right. so this space right. of a citizen and the space of a worshiper. And in my view, Jesus is making a distinction between those. And some people have thought that Jesus then is the author of the secular state as we understand it today. Again, I leave it at that uh, because I want to get into the meat of my conversation. As I prepared for my talk today, I remembered uh, a prominent national leader that comes from my county, came from my county, uh, the kind of leader that was vocal, especially during the Lancaster deliberations and the multi-party multi democracy movement, and his name was Martin Shikuku. The older members of this program will remember him <laughs> quite vividly. And Shikuku used to say, um, I, I saw Shikuku give speeches, including in Kakamega when I was younger, and he did, used to do something very interesting. He would come with sticks to his rallies, sticks. And if he had five sticks, he was going to have five points. If he had four sticks, there were four points. And he would throw those sticks, uh, those sticks at the audience um, and, and say that if I've said a lie, return the stick to me. You know? And Louis Allegiant has it that the sticks would disappear. Between him and the air, they would disappear. I don't know how true that is. I never tried to capture the stick in any of those occasions. So today I also have four points, and I have four sweets. Okay? I'll throw them at the audience, and if I'm lying, also return them to me to eat. <laughs> That's a good idea, isn't it? Ama, a good idea. So I only have four points, then I sit down, because we're going to have a debate right there. Um, the four points are very simple, and they're random points but I think they make sense. The first point um, is that there are four main models, if you look at the world, four main models. I'm not saying that's all, but I'm just saying models that have been used to guide state religion interaction. My own research shows that. And the, the models are, we have a state with an established religion. We have an anti-religious state then we have a religious state, and then we have a secular state. There could be versions in between, but those are the major um, versions or models of state religion interaction. The first one, state with an established state, is a state that has a religion of its own. The orthodoxies of this world, the Anglican Church for England, for example, are typical illustrations. The state has a religion, like the Anglican Church in England, um, but then it allows other religions to thrive. It allows the freedom of religion. If you want to know how that works in detail, England will be a typical example. The other model is an anti-religious state. And this became much 
more common, especially with the communist idea, where um, the idea that religion was an opium of the masters, I think you know that, that religion should be removed from the public sphere. It's not a good idea altogether. It was emphasized and countries like Cuba or China adopted that model. We don't want religion. In fact, we are against religion. And then the third idea or the third version of model was the religious state, where the state adopts a religion and says, we are a Muslim republic, we are an Islamic republic, we are a Christian republic, you know, and, and stuff like that. Typical examples of this model would be, of course, the papacy, Rome, you know, that's a Catholic state. Um, typical examples would be most of the Arab countries, including where the World Cup was hosted. You remember the rules? You remember? No alcohol, no nudity, no all those kind of things, and strictly applied. For the first time, we saw a disciplined World Cup. Fantastic. Some of us were very happy, isn't it? World Cups are always unruly. Um, an example of a Christian state near here is Zambia. I find that quite interesting. Zambia is a rare example of a Christian state in sub saharan Africa. It says that clearly in the constitution. So that's a religious state. But then the last model would be a secular state, which is what most of us claim to be. Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, you hear those kind of words in our constitution and even in our uh, common language or common conversations that we are secular. So that is the first random statement I make, but I want to make something else um, after that. And again, if I've lied, can I send the sweets there? So that someone can pick and eat at some point. <laughs> the second one, which is uh, the point I wish to make more seriously, is that those models are not suitable for our Africans. And for those who are familiar with me, who know the reason, it's obvious. I have since adopted the triple heritage um, framework as my conceptual lenses for discussing uh, ideas of this nature. Um, again, for those who are familiar, the idea of triple heritage um, is the idea that was conceptualized by Professor Ali Mazrui, now late. I know that is Willie's mentor and friend, he was, um, and Willie continues to keep a relationship with his son. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, and according to Ali Mazrui, that the Africans will always be an amalgam, will always be a montage or a collage, if you like, of three main civilizations. Uh, the first one is the Africans' own tradition. All Africans have a tradition. We're coming from somewhere. Our customs are, you know, our customer religion, a tradition of faith, um, and that is us. But the African has also, also interacted with the friends, and neighbors, you know, visitors. Um, some who came with good intentions, others did not necessarily come with good intentions. We are talking about the Westerners, for example. Um, they came as traders. You remember. But some also came to colonize, they came as missionaries, they came as different things. But as they came here, they also came with their traditions, including specifically the religion, okay? Um, we have the Christian faith in particular that has come with them. So you will find my name sounding John Osogo Ambani. So the John tells you there's something from the West, but Ambani tells you there's something from the Africans. And we also have Abdallahs, isn't it? Ibrahims. And, and the most interesting example of triple heritage would be our own chief justice. He actually belongs in all these faiths, isn't it? I think he's confessed that publicly. Um, so that you might find that other people took on the third one that I'm mentioning here, which is Islam, which came with the Arabs especially, and the Arabic culture or civilization. So the African is always a confluence of this civilization. That sometimes we don't know where ours starts and where theirs ends. And because of that, my argument remains that it is therefore impossible to insist on one religious formation or to insist on one kind of state for the Africans. You can't say we are religious and we are Muslim because you leave out the others. You can't also say we are Christian because you leave us out the other religions because Africans are always all this together. I can speak more confidently about Sub-Saharan Africa. And as we deal with that montage that has been forming and taking shape, or that I'll mention later, that the Western component took an upper hand because of colonialism and having the implements of power. Um, we have been confronted with another face that is also as religious as the others. 
and I call this uh, globalization. So although I adopted Ali Mazrui's conceptual framework, I also added plus one to say that we now have a global culture. And the global culture is disturbing as it is confusing and confounding. Um, we have people who call themselves secularists, isn't it? Humanists, agnostics, atheists, you've had all those things. And sometimes they don't necessarily conform to any of these religions, but they are with us here, okay? They live with us every day. And I don't know what to do with them if we insisted, for example, on a religious state or insisted on a secular state along the terms that have been insisted upon. And the terms are this. Some people have thought that by a secular state, we are talking about a state that removes religion from the public sphere. So they have sent Muslim girls away, isn't it? They have insisted that you can do exams on Saturday. They have insisted that we don't care about your leopard skin. And, and, and those are real, the real vicissitudes of the triple heritage. Because if you accept, and I hope you will, that the Africans are here with us, then you must accept that one day, Professor Ambani will show up in a leopard skin. That's what my people respect. We respect the leopard, isn't it? The people of the forest, <laughs> the great forest uh, um, that goes all the way to Congo. The leopard is the most revered animal, and sometimes we wear the skin. I should be able to show up here in a lecture in a leopard skin, and they should accept me, isn't it? Or my sister Nadia should be able to show up in her hijab, isn't it? I should be able to accept her, isn't it? I don't know what you think about that. But someone else might also want to be given some concessions to worship on Saturday and not sit exams, for example, or not work in a school assignment. And, and those are the ramifications of the triple heritage that I am asking us to think about even as we negotiate this issue. But finally, the globalists sometimes just wants to keep off church, for example, keep off religion or to believe his own things. Um, maybe believe in science, I don't know what that is, or something else. And those people are all with us. So in other words, I'm saying that if we study the composition of the African state or the African peoples, then the triple heritage would be a good guide in what to do uh, moving forward from that uh, four model that I've stated about. And I've said that the ones we prefer, especially religious state and secular state then, would not be very good for the Africans unless some modifications are done. That's where I'm going for the third point. But I want you to agree with me up to there that our composition as Africans denies capacity to obey the four models I've suggested, except with some modifications. Do you want my seat again? So this group can eat sweets. If it reaches there. <laughs> yeah. So having said that, I wish to make some suggestions on what we could do going forward. That's if you're convinced that we are different people, that we are a mosaic, a collage, I don't know what that is, but different cultures among us, and that for us to exist, we need to make certain things different from what others have been doing. So it can't be a religious state. It can't be a secular state unless modifications are made on that secular state. And that's exactly what I want to suggest as my third point. So my third point is that the way forward is to take two or so models that I can suggest quickly here. The first one was suggested by Charles Taylor. For those who have accessed my article, you can get the full citation. And I'm not talking about the politician. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure those who are old enough know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the scholar. And he talked about a certain trinity that is good for peaceful coexistence of civilizations and communities. And this trinity follows uh, those who do human rights, the three-dimensional call of the French Revolution. Right? Remember liberté, égalité, then fraternity. You remember something like that? So we start with liberties. We must allow for religious freedom, liberties. Everybody being free to enjoy his religion everyone, okay? Um, that's the first point. I've already mentioned that this might mean a system of accommodation and concessions. You, you know why? Because we are different civilizations in Africa. It might mean, uh, like it happened to me, I lived next to a mosque in Kaungware sometimes back. Uh, Senior Ongoya will know that. And in the morning, I think it was around 5 a.m. <laughs> 
Allah Akbar. Even when I'm very tired, <laughs> it might mean just allowing that guy to do that thing in the morning. Uh, I'm sure you've also lived next to a deliverance church or <laughs> evangelical church. And a day like this, this is Friday, isn't it? They might want to do a question. Do you want to make that concession? It's still a Mabati church, so they don't have money to make waterproof, soundproof, <laughs> soundproof uh, sanctuary like we can here, you know? So you'll allow some praise and worship isn't it? at night and some prayers for speaking in tongues way past midnight. I don't know. I don't know how much concessions we're willing to make. I already mentioned uh, Mr. Ambani from Kakamega or Cyril Kubai, my son from Kakamega, showing up in a leather skin or leopard skin, isn't it? In a very important forum of the university. I don't know how you'll treat that. Or in court. And, and I think when Willie was Chief Justice, he dealt with these kind of issues. So some concessions might have to be made, I think, um, in this system of liberties. So that sometimes they might step on our toes just a little bit, uh, but enough for us just say, okay, just go on. Um, unless, of course, it treats as criminal or, the, you know, it becomes an excess on our Bill of Rights, on, on our exercise of human rights. But I think some concessions and accommodation can be made under that limp of liberties. That's my point number one on that one. Number two is egalite, I said. So although we are different formations, can we accept that we can be free? and equal. Is that acceptable? I don't know where you sit. Can we accept that? Although the Catholic Church owns nearly all the schools in Kenya, okay, um, there's a small church here that is starting up, maybe just one Nobati church, that's all they have. It's also equal to that one. But also, our traditionalists are also equal to the Pope's church, or the Anglican church that colonized us, or that came with the colonizers, okay? So let's see ourselves as equal to each other so that we don't look down upon the other. But I've suggested in my article that this limp might, must and should also mean um, affirmative action for those that have been left behind. I mean here that the Westerners, for example, had an upper hand during the colonial epoch. They got all the land in Karen. The Catholic Church owns nearly the entire Karen. Okay, They got all the schools. Up to now, they have all the schools. They have control of the Board of Governors. They determine policy at educational level. And then African traditional religion, for example, Dini Sambo has no space in those formal spaces. In fact, it was put down by law. We were told it was repugnant. Our traditions were repugnant until we authored the Trinitarian Constitution and introduced a different language altogether. So they might need affirmative action to be brought up. In my article, when you find time to see it, in case you have not, or in my book, you will notice that I refer to specifically to say the school curriculum. The main curriculum in schools in Kenya is Christian religious education and Islamic religious education. The other religions are not taught. Only in very rare situations, Hindu is taught. But many times, there are even no teachers for the last two, Islamic and Hindu. So most of us were forced to study um, Christian education. Even African traditional uh, religious education was taught as part of Christian religious education. That's where I learned Bitti's uh, you remember what, what I used and went viral, uh, Bitty's idea of uh, the cyclic African time, you remember? Um, the unborn, the living, the living dead, and then the ancestors. That was taught in CRE during our days, Christian religious education. We didn't have a space for African religious education. Is it not time that we introduce such courses? And I volunteer to teach that course, even in class, class six, so that we can start shaping our society. So in other words, I mean that although we are talking about equality, affirmative action might be necessary. Is it time to have some land for this uh, independent churches movement that didn't have an opportunity to grab land during the colonial epoch? I also suggest another theory in addition to Taylor's theory, and I had to cite Western theories for our African problem, but in this case, I just had to which is the idea of public reason uh, propagated by John Rawls. I think you've read Rawls, uh, former Harvard University academic, um, very prominent uh, philosopher. If you're going to talk to the students, you know John Rawls. You've heard about distributive justice and all those kinds of things. But I'm interested here about another idea he published differently called the idea of public reason. And what he says in that idea is that 
there are spaces called public political forums. I don't know whether this is one of them, but he mentions, for example, parliament is a public political forum. The judiciary is a public political forum. Um, a political rally is a public political forum. That when you show up in those public political forums, you put aside your comprehensive doctrine, you put, you put aside your religion, okay? And you speak in secular terms or neutral terms. And you could still say the same point, but in neutral terms. So for example, I am not a believer. For example, I am a believer in God, and I believe that teenage sex is sinful, isn't it? It's a sin, isn't it? You don't seem to agree with me. Oh, sex before marriage is sinful. <laughs> yeah? I don't come to say this is a sin. But I come to parliament and say, statistics shows that HIV prevalence has reached this, this level. Many teenagers are getting this disease through irresponsible sex, okay? So sex should be criminalized. Or young people, including my students at university, are not ready for sex because they're not mature enough for it. There are a lot of mental health situations. I've been, I've been teaching for 17 years and I know this. A breakup cannot be handled by them. They go into mental health, cannot study, isn't it? Their studies are interfered with even for two semesters. Some even commit suicide. So we should discourage sex before marriage by using criminal law. So speak in neutral terms. Don't say God forbids. <laughs> you know, isn't it? But use secular language or neutral language to articulate your points. Every time you step on a public political forum, that is the idea of public reason. And I want to suggest that this should also be something to consider as we navigate difficult conversations, like the one we have now in the Republic on gay marriages and relationships, okay? I think we should have that discussion in neutral terms. I don't think it's good to come and say I'm a Muslim, so this is my position, or I'm a Christian, so this is my position, because it interferes with the reasoning that our, our chaplain talks about, it interferes with the capacity to reason together. Because if you came to me and told me you're a Muslim, I'm not, I'm a Christian, then we can't reason. But if you came to me with an idea and told me the pros and cons in scientific, in a common parlance talk, I think you can um, have a conversation with me. And again, there's a suite for that point. I don't have enough energy to throw that suite, but again, someone else could pick. So those would be my uh, main points for today. And I'll be asking us to consider them as we have a conversation. We want to hear from the main discussants. And we will begin by listening to Professor Chief Justice Emeritus, Dr. Willy Mutunga, um, to give his thoughts on the discussion and on the peace. Thank you. 